let's see, I've known Fran for I've forgotten how long, must be decades now. Shoemaker Levy, nine days, yeah, something like that. And Fran is one of the foremost experts in the study of magnetic fields of planets, the interactions of plasmas with atmospheres, and general magnetospheric processes. I'll let her explain what plasmas are, because I don't know. Um, she has worked, though, with data related to plasma fields uh, for a variety of missions, including the Voyager mission uh, to the outer planets back in the late 70s and the, the, uh, the 1980s. And she's worked on the Galileo mission, the Deep Space One mission to uh, the Comet Borelli, and she is heading up the plasma teams on the, uh, the New Horizons mission to Pluto, which I have spoken to you about before in the past. And the topic of today's uh, seminar, the Juno mission, which is the Jupiter, Polo, uh, Jupiter Polar Orbiter, currently in orbit around the planet Jupiter. So there you go, Fran. Thank you very much. Great. Huge pleasure to be here tonight to talk with you about uh, Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, and to uh, talk about the Juno mission in particular. But it's a great pleasure to be here on the talk about um, what we've been exploring in the past 50 years. Now, of course, uh, before the space age, uh, and indeed the first mission to Jupiter was 45 years ago, uh, but before that, uh, we could only observe either with our eyes or later with telescopes, uh, looking at Jupiter and to observe it in many ways. Uh, and indeed, since then, we've had a variety of missions that have either flown by, the, the pioneers, the voyagers, uh, Ulysses, often missions getting a gravity assist. So Cassini going to Saturn or New Horizons going uh, to Pluto. Uh, but then the Galileo mission that was in orbit um, and making, making many observations. Uh, and now we have the Juno mission in orbit. So I'm going to tell you a bit about that. It's been in orbit since the 4th of July um, at, uh, uh, 2016. So let's talk a little bit about Jupiter and what Jupiter involves. It's a really big planet, 11 times the radius of the Earth and uh, 318 times the mass of the Earth. So really big object that we have to keep in mind. It's a little hard to imagine, and it's a gas giant planet. So we can take the uh, planet and map it out like we do uh, with to make a map. And this is from the Cassini spacecraft. And we can compare what we see with Cassini and with the Earth. And um, these are movies uh, showing you the dynamics of the atmosphere. Uh, Jupiter and the Earth, and they're really interesting. You can see the um, the belts and zones of Jupiter. You can see the great red spot in there, and you see these uh, dynamics of Jupiter's atmosphere, and you can see the dynamics of the Earth. Now, the big difference between the Earth and Jupiter is that Earth, we have continents and we have land masses which interfere with these belts and zones. And you can sort of see this happening, uh, changing the storms. And so weather systems changing hour by hour, day by day, whereas at Jupiter, the weather systems with no um, surfaces underneath to interrupt the flows tend to keep going for a long, long time. Um, but you can also see there's a lot of turbulence. And as we get closer, with Juno, we will see a lot more dynamics in the atmosphere. So what are we looking at when we look at these big gas giants? What are we seeing? Well, on the right, you can see an image that has uh, shows the cloud structure. And what we're seeing here is that the clouds, the outermost layer clouds of Jupiter are all made of ammonia, not water, but ammonia. And so, uh, they act in many ways, similar to those water clouds of the Earth. But you have to remember, when you see white, it's fresh ammonia. Now, we know that the sunlight, particularly the ultraviolet part of the sunlight, reacts with the atmosphere and makes some browny, gunky, yellowy stuff. We don't really know what the coloring agent is. It may be phosphine, maybe some sulfur compounds. But you, what I want you to think of is that this coloring agent is a little bit like the dye you put when you 
color icing in a cake, and you need a tiny, tiny drop of the dye. Uh, you really mustn't let someone pour the whole bottle of dye into your into your cake, otherwise you'll end up with a horrendous color. Um, so you just need a subtle little bit of the dye, goes a long way to change the color uh, of the clouds in this case. And so these colors that you see are uh, white clouds that have been colored with photochemical smog. The sort of thing we see outside in Denver or in LA, you know, the famous photochemical smogs that we have above the cities. Now underneath that outermost layer, we think there's a layer of clouds that are ammonia mixed with sulfur. And then at the bottom, there is a layer of cloud, um, the water cloud. And we're pretty sure it's there. We haven't actually seen it. Um, but we're pretty sure it's there because we are pretty confident there's a lot of water in Jupiter. Now, why do we think, why do we think there's a lot of water in Jupiter? Well, the answer is that our, our, uh, the common idea of the formation of the solar system, the common textbook view, is that you had a big, um, something's gone wrong when we converted from Mac to PC here, PC to Mac, but never mind. Um, a young sun at the center, and um, we have a frost line uh, further away. So you have hot temperatures in close, rocks and metals condense out to make the rocky planets of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then beyond the frost line, we have snowballs forming, really big snowballs. And when the snowball gets to be so big, let's say 20 times the mass of the Earth, so really, really big snowball, Okay. Uh, it begins to pull in the hydrogen gas to make the gas giant planets. Uh, of course, the largest of which is Jupiter, but also Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Way around a core of water. Now, um, but we don't really know what's inside these planets. It's just a guess based on a theory at this point, knowing that water is an extremely abundant material in the solar system and therefore likely to be the center of the, these cores. So the goal of the Juno mission is to find out what's inside Jupiter and to find out, test our theories about how gas giants form. Um, not only is Jupiter the archetype of a gas giant in our solar system, but we now know thousands of other solar systems that have Jupiters, very common sized and type of planet. So this is an important thing to try and understand. So we're going to do this with a spacecraft and notice the human for scale at the bottom left. Each of these solar panels is about 30 foot long. So this spacecraft would not fit in this room. It's a very large spacecraft. Uh, we have these three solar panels and it spins every 30 seconds. So you think of it spinning like this, okay? And so when you're going to use the instruments, to look, it's great for looking at particles and measuring fields because you're spinning, you're able to look all over the sky. But for the cameras, it's much harder because you're not stopping and staring at an object, you're spinning past or scanning the object. So we have a magnetometer on the end of the boom. We then have a bunch of particle instruments called Jade and Jedi, for some reason, kind of made up names, but it's fun. Uh, we have the waves instrument that measures guess what, waves, uh, radio waves and plasma waves. We have a couple of spectrometers, the GRAM instrument and the UV uh, infrared instrument built in Italy and the UV instrument built here in Texas down at San Antonio. And then um, we have two other instruments here, a microwave instrument. I'll tell you how that works. Uh, that's very important for measuring the atmosphere, the deep atmosphere. And then we use the radio antenna to not only communicate with Earth and send the data back, but also to measure the gravity of Jupiter. Now you'll notice I've missed off this one here, the camera. Well, those of us on the designed this mission, we were interested in a spinning spacecraft that was measuring <laughs> particles and fields and gravity and all sorts of stuff. And we didn't want those darn geologists telling us what to observe which they tend to do on these missions, you know, go look here, go look there. And so we, but we had to slap a camera on because, you know, it's a NASA mission and you've got to put a camera on, take pictures, okay. So um, 
we have this camera on here called Juno Cam, and uh, you'll see the pictures are pretty darn cool. Okay. So, the important point, though, is if we want to know what it's like inside, we have to get up close. And that means that we need to um, get as close as we can, fly above the clouds. But the problem is Jupiter has these very energetic charged particles that are trapped in the magnetic field of Jupiter. So it's like a donut that wraps all the way around, and we have to avoid those. So we designed a, an orbit that goes from pole to pole, and the gravity of Jupiter is so strong that we, in two hours we go from pole to pole. So if Jupiter is 10 times the size of the Earth, that's like going around the Earth five times in two hours. Right? So it's really moving, this spacecraft, as we go from pole to pole. And then we zip through here and then go out again, send the data back and so on. Now, because Jupiter is faster at the equator, it spins every 10 hours. So it's like a big fluid thing that's um, spinning faster. The equator's fatter than the poles. This means that the orbits will inevitably change from up here going at the equator, uh, dipping down, and then by about 30 orbits, we know inevitably we will start going through this really hazardous radiation environment. So we planned on 32 orbits. We'll see how we'll do when we get to that. We're halfway through right now. Okay, so this is the goal. We want to understand what it's like inside. Is it the left-hand side of this diagram? It's the sort of textbook view with separate layers for the core, the outer layers, and so on. Um, the hydrogen separated into a metallic area. Uh, we can talk a bit about that. It's a high-pressure version of hydrogen that becomes like mercury, uh, flows, and is electrically conducting. It's like a fluid. And then beyond that, we have the gaseous um, uh, hydrogen and, and ammonia and so on. Or is it like on the right-hand side of this diagram where those heavier elements are dissolved in this high-pressure hydrogen? So these are sort of rather different views of what it would be like inside. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to measure the gravity of the spacecraft, the effect of Jupiter's gravity, and any distribution of mass on the spacecraft as it goes along. Now, we're going to send radio signals back to Earth, and we look for the Doppler shift. And so if Juno's orbit is moving due to a distribution of mass inside, then the frequency, the wavelength of this emission as it goes back to the Earth, the radio signal will change. We can measure that shift, and that tells us the speed of the spacecraft. And from that, we can deduce the distribution of mass. We've done this at many uh, planets, including the Earth and the Moon and so on. It's a common technique that we've done before. Now, the other thing is we want to know where the water is. We tried to find it with Galileo. Uh, but unfortunately, we, we seem to have gone into a very dry spot. And we don't know if it was dry because of meteorology or whether it was dry, we just happened to go to the wrong place, or whether it's dry because there isn't, well, our theories are wrong about the formation of Jupiter. So if it's formed in the way we think it is, around a core of ice with a lot of water mixed in, then we should be able to find it. Now, we want to uh, look in these uh, outer layers and see if we can find the water distributed in the outer layers. And the way we're going to do with this is by using uh, microwaves. Now, if we look on the right here, we have an image in the infrared. And what we're seeing is the heat from the inside coming out, glowing out from the interior. It's a big, giant, hot potato, if you like. It's a heat of formation that's retained inside the planet, so it's glowing inside. And uh, we see between the clouds, you can see some of that heat leaking out. Now, when you look at the infrared, you're only seeing the outermost layers uh, heat leaking out. We know that there's microwaves, longer wavelengths, uh, up to half a meter, so wavelengths as long as this, that uh, will come from deeper down. And so by looking at a, six different wavelengths, we want to map out the heat coming from the deep interior of Jupiter. And then we all know microwaves are absorbed by water, right? That's how you heat up a cup of tea in your microwave oven. And so if we see, if we want, if we see absorption of the microwaves, then that tells us that's where the water is. So as we fly over, we want to map out the amount of water that we see through the absorption of these microwaves. 
Okay, so since we're going to Jupiter, we will be measuring the magnetic field. But what's important to know is this big magnetic environment that sp spreads out beyond the full moons and, and, and beyond is strongly affected by this moon Io. So Io is completely covered in volcanoes. There's about 400 active volcanoes, uh, 400 volcanoes with about 100 active at any time. And um, we see these spots are dark areas are in fact lava. The white stuff is white sulfur dioxide frost that comes out of these volcanoes. Now, when the New Horizons spacecraft flew by uh, Jupiter, it took these pictures, this movie, and you can see here Tvashtar, this big volcano spewing sulfur dioxide uh, up into the atmosphere, 3, 000, 300 kilometers up, um, but very active um, little moon. There's no impact craters. That tells you it's extremely young, extremely volcanic um, uh, little moon. Now, what's interesting is that uh, indeed what happens is these gases uh, uh, become ionized, trapped in the magnetic field, and form this big torus, this big donut of glowing gas um, that fills up this volume. And uh, what happens is the EO is, oh, sorry, I forgot to, let me just show you this one more picture, uh, which is the new pictures from, from uh, Juno in the infrared that really shows you these glowing areas uh, all over this moon. So you can see the active volcanoes glowing with live lava spewing out. Um, so Io ejects about a ton a second of these volcanic gases that become trapped in the magnetic field. And then there's a million amps of electrical current that flow between Io and the planet, right? So this is a moon moving through an ionized environment. You induce very strong currents that flow between the moon and the planet and excite aurora in the atmosphere of, of Jupiter. So since we were flying over the poles, um, we planned to look at the aurora and measure the particles that cause the aurora. Uh, this is a Hubble Space Telescope image, shows you the type of aurora. We have a main oval, which is very st fairly steady. We have a very dynamic polar aurora, which we don't know whether that's related to the solar wind. Is it the dynamics of the magnetosphere? We don't know. That's what Juno is going to test. And then we have three kinds of magnetic footprints of electrical currents that couple Ganymede. Ganymede is the unique moon of our solar system that has its own magnetic field. It's the largest moon in the solar system. Europa, um, which is a very special moon. We can talk about that later if you want. Also has a footprint. But the strongest footprint is from Io, the moon that dumps out this ton a second of material out into space. So that's what we see from Hubble. And here's a movie just to give you a sense of the dynamics of this environment. And you see the EO footprint here, Europa, Ganymede, main aurora all over, and then the very dynamic polar environment. So we're gonna, what we're going to do is we fly over this environment, measure the charged particles, measure the magnetic field, the perturbations and the waves, look down on the aurora and try and see how the auroral processes that we see at Jupiter compare with what we see at the Earth. Test our ideas of the physics. Okay, time to go. Let's build our spacecraft. I was lucky enough to go down to Lockheed Martin, uh, south of Denver, and see them build this. It took them about uh, 18 months to put it together. Lots of engineers who worked really hard. I was just here to, to visit and have a look. Uh, but you can see, oops, the, yeah, the size of the spacecraft, really large, these big solar panels that they put on, and uh, the radio antenna, uh, um, and here they are. It's folding solar panels, because once they've built them and put it all together, they fold it up, they slap uh, a, it on top of a, a rocket, put the stickers on top, of course, very important, and... Um, just as important is to take a selfie. So we took a selfie of the team in front of the rocket and it was ready for launch. Um, of course, I'm underestimating a huge amount of work from a lot of engineers who did a fantastic job to make that happen. So we launched successfully on the 5th of August, 2011. Um, we didn't have enough ump to get to Jupiter. Um, so we came back, got a gravity assist, and then we headed out due to arrive 
And this is universal time. In California, it was the 4th of July. Okay, now before we arrived, we did something very special. Um, we were uh, approaching from the dawn side or from the Terminator. We, have the, um, we had a very special view. And this was particularly special, and I'll show you why and how. So as it says, um, we've been observing Jupiter for millennia, watching this very bright object move relative to the stars. That's what we call a planet, something that moves relative to the stars. And Galileo used his telescope to look at Jupiter and see these moons. Now, I want you to know this was taken by the camera on Juno. This is not a simulation. This is real. So what you're seeing is that the photons from the sun came 40 minutes left ago, left the sun. They come in, they bounce off Jupiter and the moons and come into the eyeballs of the camera. So the Juno, Juno cam instrument was looking at these moons orbiting Jupiter. And you can see Eo, Europa, and Ganymede, Ganymede and Callisto. Eo, Europa, and Ganymede are in this resonance orbit. Eo going around four times for twice that Europa goes around, once that Ganymede goes around. And then poor little Callisto. Come on, Callisto, you can do it, catch up. But notice how they blink out when they go into the shadow, right? So this is a real movie. This is the real thing. This is not a computer simulation. Anyway, it was very important, of course, that Galileo got a very different view from the Earth, just sporadically, night after night, didn't get this continuous view. This is the first time we've had this continuous view. And of course, very important for our understanding of the solar system and um, our understanding of uh, the moving from a, a geocentric to a heliocentric view. Uh, of the universe. Okay, so we got that chance on the way in, and then we were planning to do this orbit insertion on the 4th of July, and we were pretty nervous about this, and um, about what we would see, and we were nervous because of the radiation environment. It's the first time a spacecraft had really gone in that close to the radiation environment, fired the engines to go into orbit around Jupiter. Uh, luckily, it went well, and uh, we've since had 16 flybys. Uh, we're in 53-day orbit, so these are quite long. We do this two hours pole to pole, take the data, and then get out uh, and uh, send the data back to the Earth. And I'll show you some of the results that we've been getting. So here's the magnetic field. What's interesting is if you look at this little map here, the north is much stronger magnetic field than the south. North is much more irregular. And Jupiter seems to have a magnetic anomaly, just like the Earth has the South Atlantic or the South American anomaly. Uh, we too at Jupiter have a, an anomaly here on the, on the side. And so it's pretty much a dipolar bar magnet like the Earth and other planets, but also like the Earth, there are these irregular features which we're now beginning to map out um, by with 16 orbits and hoping to get 30 two orbits that will be able to map the field in more detail. The other thing we found out by using the gravity measurements is to get a sense of the distribution of mass. And indeed, it turns out that the, the our early idea of very separate regions of the core and then outer layers and so on, uh, it's much messier, much more mixed up. And there seems to be that the heavier elements, the what was goes into rock, so the iron and the calcium and the silicon and so on, are dissolved in this heavy, uh, this this metallic hydrogen, high pressure hydrogen um, that acts like a, a metal uh, deep down inside, and it seems like these heavy elements are dissolved. So the boundary is a lot fuzzier than we thought. We're also having some getting some hints about the deep convection deep down inside. We look at the ammonia, and the, we're learning just about uh, analyzing the water. Getting the water turned out to be a little harder to understand. So we're starting off with the ammonia. And there seems to be a convective pattern that is quite deep, extending quite a long way down uh, into the planet. Now, of course, I have to show you uh, some of the best things we're finding are from that little Juno cam camera. 
This is a public outreach camera, so it's a citizen science camera. Um, the data are put out into the public online uh, within a day or two of flyby, almost instantaneously. And you can go and look at them, you can process them, you can download them, and you can play with them, or you can discuss them, you can then post what you have done with, your, with these, pro these uh, images back up. And so this has actually turned out to be very great fun, very exciting. Thousands of people have become involved in this process. So let me show you some of the um, images that the citizen scientists have been, been playing with. So these are what you would see with pretty much true color, what you'd see with your own eyes if you flew over. And, um, uh, but what people do, of course, is to crank up the contrast and see uh, what you can do when you crank up the contrast. And of course, you begin to see some amazing stuff when you do that, lots of turbulence. Or you can play with it and do some art. Why not do some art? All sorts of cool things that people are doing creatively. Why not? <laughs> so uh, this has been fun. Uh, so others have been a bit more serious in putting together the images to make um, more scientific images. Top shows you as we're spinning spacecraft, we just get slices of the planet as we go over. We can put those together to get, give you a strip. Or we can look down on the poles for the very first time and get a sense of what's going on in the poles. And you can see it's a very different planet from the poles. Bluish, just like our sky is blue. And then red around the outside is that... Uh, is that pollution that comes from sunlight reacting with the materials in the atmosphere. So this was a total surprise. We didn't expect to see this. Uh, when we look in the infrared, very interesting, look at the North Pole, the South Pole, we see these vortices around the Central Pole. And what you're seeing here is uh, bright white and yellow is hot from deep interior. Red is cooler, higher up, and you can begin to see these vortices. Notice that there are five in the south and uh, eight in the north, very different. And this has been persistent. It's interesting to compare this with Saturn. Saturn, we have a hexagon in the North Pole, and we have a central uh, core around this, similar sort of eddies, but a rather different structure. Maybe this is related to the fact that Saturn is a third the mass of Jupiter, or maybe it's something else related to the difference in the atmosphere. We really don't know. We're sort of making this up now. We're trying to work out what's going on. If we look at Saturn, we can see a movie, and you can see this hexagon with the motions going around. This is uh, some kind of wave going around. We've, we've known this for some time. Um, but the question of why Jupiter is so different is we we've got, haven't got the answers yet. Let me show you a few of the cool pictures. Um, these are a bunch of different vortices, very turbulent atmosphere, harnessing the rotation, the momentum of the rotation rate of Jupiter. Sometimes you have dark in the center and light on the outside, sometimes the opposite. What is this telling us about the dynamics? And then there's the owls, the owly eyes. Isn't that cool? <laughs> this is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, this is a slightly more artistic version where you can see the colors are more subtle. Um, or you can really crank up the contrast and get the dynamics here uh, more towards the pole. Uh, this is a more ghoulish coloring, maybe. Here we have an amazing color contrast of different regions, uh, dynamics of these interactions, a lot of turbulence driven by shears between the east and west flows, um, and uh, winding up of these, this turbulent um, atmosphere. You begin to see now that there are also some white things that seem to be clouds sticking up. We have some here in the center. Um, this is perhaps the best version of this, what we're calling pop-up clouds. And uh, flying back from the East Coast, I took this picture out of the window of the airplane to give you a sense. This is what I think these pop-up clouds are like. Um, sticking up, these, these convecting fresh clouds coming up, and could well be precursors to thunder clouds. We do see thunder and lightning. We measure the lightning with the radio instruments and see this in the microwave. But at Jupiter, the lightning is at the poles rather than the equator. Um, so uh, a very different dynamic system. 
Here is, uh, again, one of the beautiful pictures showing the turbulence in the atmosphere. And here is a picture that is one of my favorites. Uh, that's, it looks like a woolly shawl, sort of weather for this cold weather. It would be nice to put this on. Um, now, the great red spot has been observed. This is a Voyager movie. It's twice the size of the Earth at this time and circulates every six days. This has observed, been observed for over 400 years. But when we look at it now, here's a Juno picture. It's shrunk. It's about one and a half the size of the Earth. And it seems to be rounder. The question is, is it going to disappear? Is it going to break up? Is it just going to grow back big again? Uh, we don't know. Uh, and what, why do we only have a great red spot in the southern hemisphere, not one in the north? And why is it here and so on? These are all questions about this very dynamic atmosphere um, that we weren't really expecting to take these amazing pictures. We didn't think the camera was going to last for very many orbits, and we had no idea it was going to take these amazing high-resolution views. So uh, not bad for a public outreach camera, eh? So uh, go look at the website and get involved in processing. Do your own artwork. Uh, finally, I want to show you some of the aurora, beautiful, very dynamic aurora. Lots of structure and so on. Lots of cool stuff that we're finding by looking at the aurora. So Juno is uh, flying up, up close to Jupiter, uh, looking at the clouds, measuring the aurora, measuring the charged particles, using the gravity field, the magnetic field, and the microwaves to sound out the interior and see what it's like inside. Uh, and the one thing we're learning is this cartoon that we put together at the beginning of the mission is not correct cross out. <laughs> it's much fuzzier inside and more mixed up. And what that means for formation of the solar system, that's for the theorists to start working on. Thank you very much. So if you've got any questions, I'm going to leave the movies running um, and they'll continue for a while. So we have some questions here. Let's start. Thank you. That was really amazing. Uh, so my question is regarding uh, solar system formation, the fuzzy boundaries of Jupiters. There's been work in terms of hot Jupiter's migration towards stars. Some people theorize that you can convert hot Jupiters by atmospheric ablation over time to terrestrial planet. But that seems to contradict your findings. So I'm wondering what your take might be on that in terms of habitability. So, um, yeah. So the question is, from what we're observing, is... Um, did this mixing up of the ice core, the 20 Earth masses ice core inside, uh, happen at the time of formation or did it happen later? And um, we don't know for sure, but, but probably it happened later because you're going to make the snowballs out of the water and the rock and so on coming together. And you're only going to start to dissolve into the metallic hydrogen when you have a lot of that hydrogen coming in to make the very high pressures deep inside. Okay. And so this, is, this picture is still consistent with our idea of the giant planets forming onto a core of ice and rock. And you have to be beyond the snow line to get enough water ice. And water, oxygen being the third most abundant element of the universe, you can have a lot of water. That is the obvious place to have it beyond the snow line. And so I think the idea that the giant planets, including the planets around other stars, formed beyond the snow line is still valid and you make these big gas giant planets. Now, um, it's true that you, you, there seems to be a lot of migration with these things moving in to make the hot Jupiters that we see in other systems. Um, but that probably happened after the formation out beyond the, the snow line. Now, whether you can ablate all of that hydrogen to make gas, uh, to make rocky planets, that's a lot of material to get rid of. Remembering Jupiter, 318 times the mass of the Earth, and we're talking about, you know, bleating all of that to make rocky planets. So I don't think that that later idea of leading to the rocky planets coming from the migration is, is valid. Sorry, that's a long answer, but it's, it's a big, as you can imagine, a question we're all debating in the field right now, a hot topic. We have a question here in, in the back. With water being uh, 
possibly on Jupiter? It, are you looking for the possibility of life? Okay. Um, I laugh because um, I don't think Jupiter is the place to go look for life. Um, there is, was speculated, I think it was Carl Sagan who speculated at some point that um, you might uh, actually get um, life in the clouds of Jupiter. And as Dave Grinspoon has claimed, there could be life in the, uh, the clouds of, of um, Venus. I think it's pretty unlikely. Um, you, the, our best ideas about forming life tend to be associated with actually liquid water. And that means you need to be basically uh, on a terrestrial planet, or I think the most likely is Europa. And so um, I don't think the atmosphere of Jupiter is the place to go look for life, but certainly the moons of Jupiter, in particular Europa, is the place to go look for life. And hopefully we'll do that soon. In one of your charts, you had a conceptual model of, of the atmosphere below the clouds, and it, you seem to. Uh, indicate that the metallic hydrogen would be, you no, know, the molecular hydrogen would be helium poor and the metallic hydrogen would be helium rich. Is it thought then that the metallic hydro phase of hydrogen would accommodate the helium more easily than the molecular? Yes, and also um, that it turns out that, that helium doesn't actually, is a little heavier than hydrogen and it and it's, uh, doesn't mix well. And so you know, it's a bit like oil and vinegar, and so the helium is like the vinegar. It sinks out um, from the, the hydrogen and, and does indeed dissolve better into the metallic. So that's the current idea. And it seems to be the case at, at Saturn as well. So we have some other examples of that, yeah. The only, uh, only hesitation while he's getting ready to ask the question is, we don't actually know the equation of state of the pressures deep inside uh, Jupiter and Saturn. So there's some, some question there about how these things actually work at these pressures. Knowing the environment, I, Jupe, I would have expected the spacecraft to go on to safe hold quite a few times. How is the spacecraft doing? The spacecraft is doing excellent. It's just, oh, fantastic. It's so pleased. Indeed, we were thinking a lot of the instruments would be badly affected by the radiation and wouldn't survive. We put a lot of the electronics into a vault, so we protected it with a lot of, uh, of uh, titanium to keep it protected. And um, we've covered up as much of the sensitive electronics as you can. Uh, but it turns out that the different detectors, the visible camera, the UV, the infrared, the microwave are really great at detecting radiation. So we have very good measurement of the radiation. And it's pretty much as the models predicted, so we have a good stance and we have a good sense and so the chances are pretty good we're going to last to 30. Now whether we get through 30 to more we don't know we'll have to see but uh, yeah all's going well. I gather from what you said that the uh, instrumentation aboard Juno is not giving us any insights as to the diminishment of the great red spot is that correct? Okay, so, so we can observe the great red spot from the ground, and we started observing that it's getting smaller from the Earth-based uh, telescopes. Um, and so over 15 years or so, uh, it has been getting smaller. Um, and uh, we know that because, because we've been measuring it. What Juno has done so far is to measure it mostly with the visible cameras. Um, we are going to have a flyby over the great red spot in the next couple of orbits where we will measure the microwaves and get a sense of the deeper in structure, deeper down. And we're going to measure with the gravity whether or not there's a big perturbation due to the great red spot in terms of the gravity measurements. So we hope to get a sense of how deep it extends. We know it pokes up a little bit above the clouds, the other clouds, uh, the, the weather system. Um, we'll get a sense of the structure, we hope, um, in the next few orbits. Uh, and that will tell us a bit about how it's twisting. Um, how deep it is, like some sense of the perturbation uh, around it. Um, but we will get those measurements. More to come. Watch this space. Thank you. Uh, how much longer do you think the mission will go on, and is there a disposal plan at the end? So um, 
we don't know how long it'll last. Um, everybody says, oh, everything's great. It'll be fine. It'll last forever and ever, right? We always do that. Some people are speculating, oh, maybe we can do 50 orbits, 60 orbits, 70 orbits, right? And the, how the orbit processes if we to do that. Um, but the reality is that we will be getting into those radiation belts, and that will be nasty. So we're going to have to wait and see, and so make some decision um, uh, as we approach that 30. So we've got a couple more years before that happens. Now, disposal. We must not hit a certain object. Which object? Europa, Europa right? Because this spacecraft is bringing bugs from Earth. It's not super clean. It's clean, but not super clean. So there are inevitably going to be some bugs that we're carrying with us, and we do not want to contaminate um, what life there may be underneath the ocean on Europa. Now, we did do some studies, and it looked like the speed that we would hit Europa would probably vaporize everything, um, but you can't be 100% certain, and so we will go and dispose of uh, Juno in the planet. That's the plan, yeah. When we run out, when the, when the instruments start to fail and, and things don't work. I know we've got one more question back here, but before we get that, do we have anyone in the overflow room by any chance with a question? Let's continue with the question in the back row. Uh, any big surprises? Have you found anything that you just never would have dreamed you, you would find there? Anything that blows up your theories? Well, I, I would say those poles. The pole of seeing those vortices which have actually been persistent, by the way, over two years. Um, those those five at one side, one end and eight at the other. I think that was a big one of the biggest surprises was to see these vortices persistently there. And and um, we were expecting you know it'd be maybe a pentagon or a heptagon. You know, I mean it's not going to be the same hexagon that 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 uh, Saturn has, but we weren't expecting to see those persistent vortices in the pole. That was one big surprise. Um, and the detail of this atmospheric structure, this level of turbulence, I don't think anyone really expected that either. We're also seeing surprises in the aurora. The, uh, it looks like the physics is rather different from the Earth, where we have a very persistent behavior of the Earth, where we have uh, potential drops, voltages that accelerate particles to cause the aurora. And Jupiter seems to be more wave-driven, more turbulent. Um, uh, that was a, another big surprise, and um, I think we were surprised by the magnetic anomaly. We weren't really expecting Jupiter to have such a strong magnetic anomaly. So those were all big surprises um, that we weren't expecting. Yeah. The uh, the number of vortices at the poles are Fibonacci numbers. Is there any particular physics behind <laughs> that? I mean, they show up in nature all the time. Is there... I think you should write a paper about that. Uh, in that equatorial belt there, there's equally spaced uh, white ah, pages. Yes, what are the those? White, uh, the string of pearls, they're called. Those are vortices. Those are indeed, and they're quite fresh clouds, so you can see they're white. So that looks like it's material that's coming up and, and uh, because of the Coriolis force uh, causing these, these eddies. But they're relatively fresh because they're, they're white. They don't have this dark accumulated um, photochemical uh, gunk in the atmosphere. So they're fresh, and they seem to be fresh vortices. So um, that's we've seen them before from the Earth, as, as well as more detail here with Juno. Um, but they're just more storms, basically. <laughs> Were there any theories about what metallic elements may be in the metallic hydrogen? So the metallic hydrogen is hydrogen, okay? And so um, let me tell you a bit about the pressure at the center of Jupiter. Shall I do the interpretive dance? Is that okay? <laughs> so the way it works is this. If you take, uh, if you think of the pressure in this room, right, and you think of pressure, pressure is force per unit area. So there's a certain amount of pressure through my feet due to my weight, the Earth's gravity. Okay, and so there's a pressure, force per unit area. What happens that pressure if I stand on one foot? Pressure go up or down? Up by a factor of two. Okay, it doubles because I'm. So to get the pressure in this room, you would actually have to have 
five people standing on my shoulders. And then the pressure through my feet would be equivalent to the pressure in this room. Now you may say, I don't believe that, I'm so you, but you were used to this pressure, right? But that is, you can do the arithmetic, that's what it is. Now to get the pressure at the center of Jupiter, you need a lot more mass, right? 318 times the mass of the Earth, it's a lot of mass. And so instead of humans, let's take um, elephants. So you need to have a thousand elephants standing on top of each other with the bottom elephant standing on one foot on a stiletto heel. <laughs> That's the pressure at the center of Jupiter. Now at those pressures, in fact, you don't need to go quite down to um, 100 million bars, you half um, million bars, you get hydrogen can changes from being two protons and two electrons bound together as a molecule to being separate protons and electrons moving. They can move separately. And so positive and negative charges can move relative to each other. So it becomes electrically conducting. This is technically a plasma. And so at those high pressures, it's a conducting fluid. Sort of the density of mercury or liquid iron, okay? And so you can now imagine that just like the liquid iron core that we have on the Earth has a dynamo, a magnetic dynamo associated with the flowing motions in that conducting fluid, the same is true at Jupiter, except this is hydrogen. Hydrogen that's compressed, broken up to make separate protons and electrons, and that is liquid metallic hydrogen where the dynamo is produced. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question. You mentioned Cassini, and which ended its mission a little over a year ago. And during its final phases, its final months, it effectively did a Juno mission, where it entered a polar orbit very close to the cloud decks. Has, I assume that the two teams, the Cassini, uh, the, sorry, yeah, the Cassini and the Juno teams are are collaborating and making comparisons. Have, has you, have you seen any differences or similarities between the two giant planets? So indeed, there are substantial differences between Jupiter and Saturn, and the teams are working in various areas. So the two areas I know a little bit more ab ab about, one, I, I've been following a little about the interior, and the difference between the interior of Jupiter and Saturn, and, and it, indeed the Cassini last fl flight, have been telling us about the magnetic field and the gravity of the deep interior. Remember that Saturn is a third the mass of Jupiter, so instead it's about 100 Earth masses, and so the pressure is much less. You don't get to that metallic hydrogen until you're about um, uh, halfway down, whereas with Jupiter it's out at about 80 to 90 percent of the radius. So much, much deeper to get to that metallic hydrogen. The dynamo is a lot weaker. And it turns out that the um, dynamo has become very um, aligned with the rotation axis because you've got flows inside um, that are making it very symmetric. Um, but there's some big questions about whether at Saturn you have the same dissolving of the, um, the heavy elements into the metallic hydrogen as we think we have at Jupiter. And it may be the pressure is just not quite enough to do that. So those are important differences to compare. There's the differences in the atmosphere I talked about, the, at the polar region, the hexagon versus the polar vortices. Uh, and then the aurora are somewhat different as well. So we've been comparing those and contrasting them. So it's always really useful to compare and contrast two planets. And uh, I wish we could just compare Venus with Earth. Isn't it sad how we don't explore and understand our neighboring planet, Venus, and so much like the Earth, but so different? I wish we could send some more missions to Venus so we can compare it with the Earth. That would be a great pair to compare. Yeah. Do we have any final questions? You showed a very impressive. Um, moving of the magnetic field. 
And you also told us that there was one million amp of current yes. in the torus from Io. Now, I could not see visually any distortion of the main magnetic field lines from Io. Yes. Okay. So, actually, it's funny because I ran a workshop Monday and Tuesday in Boulder in my hometown uh, of the, the people who work on this stuff. The 25 of us got around talking about this and particularly that very topic you talked about. What is the perturbation in the magnetic field due to that million amp current that is flowing between EO? And it turns out it's much more complicated because it bounces back and forth and it makes that uh, aurora that goes all the way around Jupiter. Well, it turns out a million amp sounds like a lot, right? The huge amount of current. You want to, wouldn't want to touch that, right? But it turns out that the magnetic field of Jupiter is so strong but the perturbation is very weak. Now, we have measured it, but it's very hard to measure. It's a small perturbation, and um, they've had to work very hard to get it. But they have got the measurements, and I'm hoping the kid's going to publish it any day now. Um, but we have measured it. Furthermore, we flew through the um, actual flux tube on, on orbit 12 on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, right? Anyway, we flew through it. And we measured the charged particles that are flowing back and forth. We measured the, the waves, the plasma waves and the uh, um, magnetic field and so on. And uh, we actually flew right through it. So it was really cool. Yeah, yeah, very strong fluxes. So, yeah. Thank you for asking that. That's my area, so I get excited about it. <laughs>